Welcome back to Kettlebells and Cocktails. Without my bestie, Nikki, uh, in our new segment called Master's Moments, which tonight is probably just going to be two old guys talking about how bad their ankles feel. And uh, <laughs> I have a, a good friend on, special guest, Eamon Coyne. Eamon, how are you? I'm great, man. How are you? I am good. I am okay. good. So I know you, but I don't know if everybody knows you. A lot of Master's athletes know you because you're obviously very well connected within that community. But won't you, let's, let me get a little bio out of you. What's your background within CrossFit? Where do you come from? What have you done? Give me your, your 30 second clip. I started CrossFit in 2005 on the USS Ronald Reagan. I was in the Navy. College hockey player, looking for something new. Stumbled into CrossFit while I was in the Navy and I've opened, I've helped open a number of affiliates, but I currently own one. Across a palace with Tim Paulson in upstate New York and Masters Fitness Championship. I was the competition director and owner for three years, two years, three years. Um, yeah, I've been in the space for a very long time. I've operated as a coach and athlete. I was fortunate enough to go to the games at 21, competed at all the, the big competitions. You're, you're so low key about all this. So you, t Tim is my boy. I love to, I actually, let me rephrase that. The Paulson family. Oh man. Are like, it, it, I have, there are two CrossFit families that I literally think like if they, if either of them called me today and said, John, get in your car, come to my house. I need help. Mm -hmm. It would be a no questions asked. And it would yeah. be the Panchecks and the Paulsons. Yep. Yeah. Tim, Tim's, Tim's family. His mom and dad, his sister, Caitlin West, they're, they're amazing. They're, a, it's just, it's like the family that I want to have. Yeah. So. They're, they're, they're pretty ridiculous. And West might be the cutest baby that ever lived. <laughs> yeah, whoever that, he, he's pretty adorable, but I, he's I, pretty run adorable. In, I run into Papa Paulson at every competition. He's like, where's Waldo for me? It's not a real competition until I run into the dad. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and kind of the same thing we're doing here. He and I sit around and just complain about how bad we feel and how sore we are and uh, and he's super fit he's got a he's got a uh hip replacement too and yeah what and he's able to do draw, like, crazy strong well look at his kid right yeah well <laughs> he just he had to get it from somewhere i guess i it's funny yeah scott's dad's the same way it, it's funny how that those things run in the family it didn't run in my family for whatever it's worth. I got two daughters. They don't do shit. They don't do a thing. <laughs> I take that back. My oldest was a runner for a while and she was a really good runner. She doesn't want to do it anymore. But when she was doing it, she was doing it. So I, it's at least one person in my family has some athleticism. I don't have it. So that's probably why I didn't pass down. I guess yeah, I my, figured my out my family, own problem. My, my parents have been lifelong smokers. So there's... There's that, right? How, how did you overcome that? Did you, is it you just look at it and go, okay, I don't want that for myself or? No, I, I mean, when I was a teenager, I, I was kind of an unruly kid. So I, I had a very early start to the party lifestyle. Right. That's what forced me into the Navy really. Okay. Yeah. My, Making better, my, better decisions. My dad smoked. I, so I grew up, how old are you? What's your age? Four, I'll be 43 next month. Okay. So you're, you're, you're a young masters. I'm an old yeah. master. Yeah. I, I was born in 1970 and uh, my dad smoked when I was little, mm -hmm. like a chimney. And it is, this is, I vividly remember the stereotypical seventies car with the big bench, big bench front seat. And there are no yeah. seat belts. They just use their arm to stop yeah. you when they hit the yeah. brakes. Yeah. And it's just full of empty cigarette boxes and crumpled coffee cups. Yeah. And at some I point ashes all over the place. Oh, everywhere. And everything smells like smoke. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was a cool smoker. He could, uh, he could blow the smoke rings like oh, across yeah. the room and, mm -hmm. and he could blow a smoke ring inside a smoke ring. It was awesome. <laughs> he was the shit. Like I idolized my dad. I still do, but I really did that. Yeah. And uh, at some point he was just like, all right, I'm done. And he just quit. Just quit just out of nowhere. Cool. Like he had smoked from the time he was 18 until I want to say 40. And literally quit cold turkey. I'm good. I've, I've yeah. had enough tobacco. Well, well, we had bugged the shit out of him. 
Like it was in those days when people were starting to figure out, they're like, oh, wait, this is killing us. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, we, uh, we were just bugging him. You got to quit smoking. And he did. Yeah. He's never smoked since. And to this day, he says he still craves it. Like he still, he smells it and he's all, oh, this smells great, but he hasn't touched one. It's impressive. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what drew you to the Navy? It was the only door that was open when I went into the recruiting shop. How so? Yeah. You didn't, you didn't want to do college or what was the deal? So I, I started into college. I was recruited by a small D3 school to play hockey. And my partying lifestyle just kind of like transitioned right into college, just made it easier. After my first semester, I had a 0. 0.06 GPA. We're like uh, twins. We're like yeah. twins, baby. Yeah, you, you got to work real hard to get that 0.06. You, you, it's a struggle. It's it's yeah. hard to get that 0. 0.6. It really yeah. is. 0. 0.06. Oh, so, oh, even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I realized that I needed to take some time off and kind of get my priorities together. Started working. My dad was teaching at a college at the time. I went and did some community college, finished up with my associates. Went back into a four-year degree, still kind of doing the same stuff, working in bars and that kind of lifestyle. I was about 21 at the point, so just everything just became easier. Nice. What's up? What was your, what was your role in the Navy? I was an information systems technician. I have so no I idea did, what that means. Sir. I did uh, secure and unsecure networking. I did radios. Um, message receiving and transferring and a lot of that really okay. boring IT stuff. And what, how long were you in? Four years. Okay. Were, did, were you deployed or was this all in the States? Nope. I, I did two shipboard deployments on the USS Ronald Reagan. And then I did a six month pick in Iraq and a year in Afghanistan. Oh, wow. Yep. I got attached to the 10th mountain in Iraq and 25th signal battalion out of the army in Afghanistan. All right. So forgive my ignorance because I, I have a brother-in-law that was in the Air Force and that's about my extent of military knowledge. So when you mm. say you're, when you say you're attached, you on a ship, you off the ship, nope. where were you? No, I got, I was what's considered an individual augmentee. So at that time of the war, 2005 in Iraq, it was pretty busy and guys had been on like two deployments in like three years, like pretty long, like year, 18 month deployments. So they wanted to augment some of the army guys with, instead of using the national guard with some of the other branches. So we got kind of like thrown in there and same thing happened in Afghanistan. So I was actually attached to the army unit. So interesting to me. I think those of us that didn't have the balls to do that, you know, you think Navy, you're like, all right, you took the easy way. I, that's, I think that's what a lot of people think. I'm not trying yeah. to be insulting to the Navy by any stretch. Cause it's like anybody that serves is like. Nothing but respect, but you know, you think, all right, well, you're on a boat somewhere you're, so you're out there, you're out in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's, uh, it blows my mind, man. I'm, I'm an all in kind of guy though. When I joined, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. So I started going through that whole process and I'm rolling out and then went to the fleet and I was like, well, I have an opportunity to still go to war. So I'm going to go to war. And that was, like I said, it was early on in the in the 9-11 era. So uh, I had the opportunity and I took it. Yeah, I was in that, uh, it, it, I'm 10 years older. So I got the first Gulf War was my experience. Mm -hmm. And so all my friends, we were all, that, those were in the early days. You're like, oh shit, are we going to get drafted? And we're all like <laughs> losing our minds. Yeah, because the last war was Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. It, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the first Gulf War was over like that. We just routed them. Yeah. And so we're like, all right, well, this will never happen again. And then of course it did. And then 20 years of it. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then we probably, we're still fighting. It's, yeah. it's, it's really kind of crazy when you start saying it out loud that way. Yeah. How did, uh, how did CrossFit come into this on the, on the Ronald Reagan? I was on the hangar deck. So on a, on an aircraft carrier, you have the flight deck, which is where the planes take off. And then you have the yeah. hangar deck where they store everything. And there were some EOD guys that were over at the only pull up bar on the whole entire ship doing a workout. And I kind of like walked over and I was like, what's going on over here? Started a conversation with them and they're like, meet us here tomorrow at, I forget what time, 0600 or whatever. 
for a workout. So I met him and we did Fran and that was that. Why is it always Fran? It's oh, always, no. it's always Fran. I don't know. It took me 17 minutes to do that workout. Yeah. Yep. I've Strict pull-ups, front squats to a press, 95 pounds. So were you doing this for general preparedness or? Yeah, I, I was, because? you know, I was, I've been like doing complex lifts, like squats and deadlifts and things like that for 20 years at that point playing hockey. So it was just like a natural progression into, oh, I can do these faster. Yeah, I'm into that. So instead of just droning away with my headphones on in the, in the ship's weight room, I would meet them down, get play with bumper plates and drop weights. And it was a whole new world to me. We just had uh, Aaliyah Miller. Do you know Aaliyah? Yeah. Aaliyah Miller? We had her on a few weeks ago and she was a similar story. Found it in the military and she was doing it to shit a, I forget what she told me her time was, like a 20 minute run time. My, my, mm -hmm. It's a really horrible, like two mile run, whatever run you have to do in the army to. Two mile run. Yeah. yeah. It was like 20 minutes for her and she had to get it down significantly less than yeah, that. Like 16 or 17. Yeah. yeah. I think it was 16 if I remember mm -hmm. right. And that's why she found CrossFit. And I'm, I'm always interested in, in how many of those in the military that find CrossFit for that reason and how many stick to it. Why do you think? Military stick to CrossFit so closely. I think it probably has to do with, it probably has to do with, with how hard it is, right? It, it's not, it's not easy Cro doing CrossFit. I mean, back when I started, it wasn't easy because there was no such thing as scaling, right? It was like, you do the right weight or you don't do the work. Right. Yeah. I remember. Uh, yeah. And I think it, it was like, it was just a new challenge and it just kind of became part of, well, this is what I'm doing. This is the, the physical training that I'm doing. I can get everything that I need to get done to be physically prepared for anything in 30 to 30 to 60 minutes. Right. So you're able to knock that out and move on with your day. You got your training in you're good to go. Yeah. I'm always, uh... I'm always interested because CrossFit feels so different to me in some ways, like the military is very strict. So I'm always thinking strict pull-ups. Like anytime I, we're at a CrossFit event, there's always army or someone is there, Marines, whoever, mm -hmm. and they'll have a strict pull-up challenge and CrossFitters just failing hand over fist. It's the best. <laughs> it's the best. I love it. <laughs> they want to keep, nobody knows how to stay on the bar without moving their shoulders. Without, yeah. yeah, without. Staying in a hollow position. Yeah, it's the best. It's <laughs> absolutely the best part of any event is watching CrossFitters try to not cut. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what I think of when I think of the military is it's, it's literally the hardest thing ever. So I'm always amazed when they find CrossFit. And, and to your point, I, I agree with that concept that we do a lot of really, really hard things. And so I can see how they would stick to it. But we also do a lot of very loose things. <laughs> so I'm, I always feel that kind of conflict between the two of fast and loose. Yeah. A little bit. I see that. Yeah. So, so once you got out of the military, then obviously you stuck with it. Did you go, did you immediately get into an affiliate or what was your next progression? So I got into, I started at Mount Baker CrossFit when I was in the Navy. And then when I separated in 2008, I moved back home to Pennsylvania and my wife was doing a, an internship at, my wife's a exotic animal veterinarian, but she wanted to get into large animals. So she was doing an internship at UPenn out of their, their large animal the hospital or whatever. Met her. I was still doing CrossFit and trying to figure out my life being out of the military. And uh, she was a big bike, like a uh, cycle and runner. Not quite a triathlete, but she liked those two portions of it. Yeah. So I was like, she's got, a, she, she got an right. engine. Right. Yeah. I was like, I want to impress this girl. So I started doing running events and things like that. <laughs> and I, I was like, this is for the birds, man. I don't want to do this right. anymore. And I did one marathon with her and I was like, that's good. Check that box. We're done. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kept training in like a Globo gym doing CrossFit. Up until probably 
probably like 2010 when I started doing it at the gym at, at Tim and Mai's college, Ithaca College. And then in 2012, we opened across a palace, small little 800 square foot garage. And that was kind of it. That was it for me. There's nothing that will impress a woman less than her watching you run at mile 20 of a marathon for the record. <laughs> I think I stopped at mile 20 and I was like, I need a break. Did you, did you, yeah, did you, I was like, did you complete oh, yeah, it? I did. You finish Sub it. four hours. Sub wow. Four. Damn, yeah. that's serious. That, dude, that's real running. <laughs> I trained for a marathon once. Dude, I trained once and, you know, I ran a half and then I'm like, all right, I'll never do that again because that was terrible. And because I'm a CrossFitter and I'm just wired stupidly, I'm like, yeah, I said I'd never do a half, so I'll just go do a full. Why not? Yeah, I'll you know? just do the whole thing. Yeah, I'll just do the whole I have, thing. I have this, I have this, it's, I mean, I'm, I think it's a belief. I don't know. I think anybody that's been training seriously in CrossFit for probably about two years can go do at least a half marathon on training. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. Um, some of the uh, some of the more elites can probably do a, a full marathon untrained. Spieler did a full marathon once. Took him like five and a half hours without training. Just went and oh, did it. Just he was like, I'm going to go for a run in Colorado. Yeah, just fuck it. I'm just going to go run. I'm or just going to do it. No, he did. Yeah. did an actual race. I, f- I forget what his actual time was, but I'm positive it was over five hours. Because <laughs> I trained hard and mine was over five hours. <laughs> I, uh, I trained my ass off. Dude, this is a true story. Like I trained my ass off and I was running pretty good. And I did the first half of that in two hours flat. And, uh, and I'd stopped three times to pee because I wasn't smart enough to pee before I was running, started. <laughs> and so I was running pretty fast pace. And so I'm running with that group that's at the kind of the four hour mark. I got the pace runner out there mm-hmm. and I hit, I want to say it was mile. It was either 18 or 20. And I could, I swear to you, I felt my left foot break. I just oh. felt, I just felt it. Now it, it wasn't a real break. It was like a, like a stress fracture, but it hurt yeah. like hell. Yeah. And, and then you feel it run up to your knee and then to your hip. Yeah. And it, the last three miles took me a full hour. I remember, man, I remember running past and I'm putting the word running in air quotes for those not watching. I, uh, I'm going past one of the nurse station and it's like on the entire other side of the road and nurse comes out. She sees me running and she comes out of the tent. That's when you know you're in a bad shape when they like leave the tent. Yeah. Yeah. She comes out and she's like, do you need help? And I, I literally turn to her. I'm like, do you have an epidural? And she's (laughs) no. And I'm like, then I'm fine. And I just keep hobbling because I'm an idiot. (laughs) I wanted the medal. And I think that's the thing about CrossFitters. We're just like, we're wired toward whatever the goal is. We're going to go get it. And you know what I wanted? I wanted, it, we got two things in that marathon, a medal and socks. That Perfect. was it. I did it for a pair of socks. Do you still have them? Uh, no, but I still have the medal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm proud of that medal, man. Like that's a, that's a real accomplishment. That's a know? real accomplishment. Yeah. Running a marathon. Nobody actually, have you ever seen a happy runner? No, I was no, not. They one. don't smile. Yeah. Yeah. I have photos from that race and no one will ever see them because I look miserable on every one of them. I think you need to post them in the show notes. Oh my God. They're so bad. <laughs> the, I have one running photo here at the house somewhere where I actually kind of look like semi cool. I was like yeah. a trail run and I have like a vest on and trail <laughs> shoes and, but, and that was a long race too, but some of those marathons, man, they're just dumb. And the whole point of the story is you're not going to pick up girls running marathons or just your house. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I picked my wife up, but that's, well, she that does counts. cross it. That, can, that counts. Cross it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you guys opened Pallet. Did you have any dreams at Palace? Oh, because Palace took off, dude. You guys are, you guys are a real life gem now, like a real thing. Well, we are a real thing. We're uh, coming up on 12 years of affiliation. Yeah. When we opened it originally. I come up on 11 years. I'm sorry. Tim and I both had jobs. We, we, so Tim and I played hockey together at Ithaca college and we both got into the MBA program at Ithaca college. So we both did MBAs while we were there. We opened the gym. I was doing an internship at Boeing out in Seattle and he was doing an internship at KPMG down in Philly. And my wife went and looked at this little old electric handyman repair shop building. 
the rent was like, oh, sorry, I, my dogs are barking. Not my feet. My feet are fine. Yeah. Just my dogs barking. No, you're old. Your feet probably hurt too. That's fine. <laughs> I think the rent was like 1200 bucks or something like that. Just little 880 square foot space. Somebody took a dump in the bathroom. Everybody in the gym knew it, right? Right. No, those are the best gyms. By oh, yeah, it was so bad. It was, Tim used to pee with the door open. And I was like, bro, you got to close the door, man. You know, clients go, oh my God. But yeah, we, I mean, we opened it with every intention and plan of having somebody manage it for us. We both took jobs with each of those internships and, um, within three months after we opened it, Tim turned his job to KPMG down and I was gonna, I was like, I'm still going out to Seattle. And uh, my wife and I were having a really hard time finding housing out there. This was back in 2012, 2000, yeah, 2012. And so we were like, I think it was a pretty great little town. Let's stay here for a bit. So we did, and uh, we ended up going from that little 880 square foot garage to, we had a, a guy who was in looking to build a building and he needed tenants. And now we are in an 11,000 square foot gym. So our, our bathrooms are bigger than our original gym. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's amazing how many of these 10 year affiliates, when you talk to affiliate owners. We originally started with just a couple of guys that just wanted a place to train. That's mm -hmm. it. We just want a place to train. We're going to bring some people in. They'll pay for it. It'll pay for the space. We'll break even. We're good. Yep. We're, we're going to keep our jobs. We'll just hire some coach to come in and do it for 10 bucks an hour. And that's it. Yep. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I got a real business here. Oh crap. This took off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're not the only ones that love this. It's amazing yeah. how many gems you talk to that are like that. It's, it's, it's probably it. In my opinion, one of the most beautiful things about the CrossFit story, you know, mm -hmm. you, you look back, those of us have been around for a while. For me, it's been 12 years and uh, it, I've seen all these gems kind of pop up and, and it's, some just fade away, but the ones that have done it right, which is what you're describing, which is you're doing it because you love it, not because it's, uh, you're trying to make money. You just want to do it the right way. They, it's like a, it's like a flower, man. It just blooms. And just keeps blooming. It's yep. really amazing. It's, it, um, I can honestly say that, that CrossFit encompasses every aspect of my life and not in a weird cultish way, but I personally, I genuinely want to make people better, right? Whether that's through movement, whether that's through nutrition, whether that's through as, as coaches and owners, we kind of become these like ad hoc therapists for a lot of people. And it's just like sharing experiences with, with, with members, with other gyms. Um, I've probably coached in the 13 years I've been coaching. I've probably coached gotta be at least 10,000 people or more than that. Yeah. I mean, I was at. I was at, when I was living in Boston, after we left New York, I moved to Boston with my wife following her work. And there was a point in Boston where I was coaching at four or five different gyms at the same time. Dude, that's, that's insane. Just the fact that you would live in Boston, not, not about the number of things. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Boston's just, a little crazy. I know. I just ruined like a huge segment of our following. <laughs> I love Boston. Wait, the bank I work for, our corporate offices are there. So I go to Boston a couple of times a year. And okay. It's an amazing city if you can get past the accent. That's all I'm saying. If you can get past, well, we were out, we were out, I was about a 10 minute drive to Worcester. Yeah. So we were, we were way out. My, the, the thing I always make fun about Boston is it was like a few years ago when the Patriots were in their heyday and they had Tom Brady. We could not have a freaking conference call without somebody coming on and railing about how great the Patriots were in that horrible Boston accent. And I'm sorry, Boston, but I'm from the South and I know a lot about really shitty accents, but Boston's right at the top of the list, right behind Mississippi, which is where I'm from. So you're yeah. second. Yeah. And uh, it was always, and it's so stereotypical. Tom Brady's so wicked this and wicked that. I'm like, <laughs> shut up. No one cares. We know you're the best. We know you're the best. Just shut up. I was at a, 
a Super Bowl party when having grown up, I grew up in Philly. And having grown up in Philly, the year that the Patriots played the the Eagles and they lost. Oh yeah, and I, I was I was at a party, like a Super Bowl party, and I was like, "All right, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out now. I'll see you later." I didn't have to like like hope somebody doesn't shoot you on the way out, right? Well, so that's the thing. Our second biggest round of offices are in Philly, and okay. fortunately, I'm from Cleveland, so like yeah. we have nothing to brag about, like literally nothing. <laughs> so we were never in the mix for who was going to beat who. Yeah, Johnny funny. football. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> But it, Johnny football brought us like two wins and we were ready to build a freaking statue of that guy out in front of the stadium. Cause there's more wins you guys had in the past 10 years. It was the same with Baker Mayfield. That guy took us to the playoffs and I thought they were going to make him mayor. It was. Uh, at, at this point, we've, we've gotten smart enough to understand this year. We actually have a pretty good team. And I say yeah. that not even tongue in cheek, like they've got the talent but there's not a soul in the city that thinks they're going to make the playoffs. It doesn't matter how good they are until it actually happens. We're like, no, nope, not going to happen. Like, mm-hmm. kind of proof. Yep. Just uh, the way it happens. But like I said, I grew up in Philly, man. I get it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Philly fans are hard. Philly, Philly is a hard city, man. Yeah. All the, I don't live there anymore. All the way around for yeah. the city of brotherly love. They, it's a, it's a hard edge city. Gotta love That's it though. The pretty hard edge city. Well, let's talk about master's athletes because you sure. you clearly have a huge passion around that being part of the master's fitness collective, which is if you've never been for anyone listening or watching, if you've never been, this is my opinion, you're not putting me up to this. I think it's the premier master's event that you can go to. Like it's, it, it's every bit as good as the games or anything else you've seen from quality programming layout of the the auditorium itself, announcing, kind of like celebrating what masters are able to do. And bluntly, as a master's athlete, like I'm always one, like I'm in the, at least as far as the open is concerned, in that 90th percentile, right? So I'm reasonably fit. I watch the guys that come compete at your competition. I'm like, nope, can't do it. Not even close. The programming is so hard. I'm like, I would never, I would never be able to do this. And it's, that's what makes it so, job. yeah, it's what makes it so impressive that mm-hmm. you'll get someone in their fifties doing these ridiculously heavy lifts and muscle ups and handstand walks and, and you, there's nothing easy about what you guys do. And so it's just, it's really, really impressive the competition you put on. So if you get a chance, check it out. Yeah. I mean, we, we started that out of, um, we started it in 2020, the COVID year because the masters didn't have an opportunity to finish out their season. Right. And there's four of us, it's myself, Jamie free, Bobby Petrus and Heath Moody. He's been to the games a couple of times and we were like, let's throw a party. Let's throw a party and, and invite all these people that qualify so they can finish their season out. And the first year was a really fun, I mean, we pulled that off in three months. And that was a really fun event to run and with every intention of being like, all right, that's it. We're good. And then it gained so much popularity that people wanted to come back the next year. So we threw it again. And then last year we had, it was like, I think it was like 534 athletes or something like that. The issue we ran into last year, which I still feel a lot of frustration is not the right word, but still feel a lot of like ownership of is we didn't have a ton of, we didn't have enough judges, right? So we ran that judging staff ragged. There were some other issues that we had and it's, it's a learning process. So this year, Jess Ortiz is actually the competition director, Ron Ortiz's wife. And she's taken everything that we built over the first three years and pretty, pretty much systemized it. To the point that this year is going to be, I think it's going to be the best year we've had yet. So. Yeah. I think that judging piece is hard for everyone. Well, I mean, you see it, at, you see it at the games level. So I don't, I'm not sure anybody would ever blame you for that. How do you find enough qualified people that can take time off and come do this and, and want to do it for one? Cause it's a real commitment, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, our, our problem was, is, is timing last year, Rogue was the following weekend. The, the rogue invitational. So all the judges want to go to rogue, right? Right. So, and they're not going to travel two weeks in a row. And it was just poor planning on my part from when we could have hosted it. 
So I'd, I'd love to see the community have kind of no different than the NFL traveling judging team mm -hmm. that goes from event to event and the community is able to, to your point, plan it out where they can make those moves and gives us just gives us far more consistency to the sport. I mean, it's an entirely different topic than what we're coming to tonight, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just such Cross a struggle. CrossFit has, has the levels for, for coaching, right? And they have levels for one through four. Why isn't there a system of judges, right? Of like accumulating that, that like level status, right? I mean, most of the judges do travel together. And that's the thing yeah. is that they all go to the same competitions and it's like they get an Airbnb and they hang out and they judge all day and then they download at night and it's, it's part of their, their core, core existence. So. Yeah, it's, uh, see, now you're getting Ramir riled up. Damn it. Yeah, it's no different than the athlete side, though. The PFAA hasn't really taken off completely yet. So, like, the athletes don't have enough power because they haven't truly unionized, even though they're really trying and mm -hmm. they're doing a lot of good work. It's not a complaint on them. They just, they're in the infancy. And the, the judging is the same way. These umpires in, or whatever, or in NFL, Major League Baseball, wherever, they all have unions and mm -hmm. rules and standardized how they do their job. And CrossFit's just not there yet. I think it's a money issue. It's absolutely a money issue. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's not a lot of money in the sport yet. And that, I, it, it's funny. I, I've been saying that for weeks now. I, at some point, CrossFit's going to open their eyes and go, oh, shit, all the money's a master's. <laughs> these, these are all the people that are paying our bills. So maybe we should give them more attention, but we'll get to that another day. Another day. Yeah, yeah. I was really, you're a master's athlete. You've competed as one. Mm -hmm. You're coaching one. For me, like the big curiosity are the differences of, of coaching or maybe the, the, I joked off the air with you, the special needs of a master's athlete above these elite, like the elite athletes like Tim. He's, he's a funny guy to me. Like every time I talk to him, I'm like, Hey, come on the show. He's like, great. It has to be at 6 PM. Cause I go to bed at seven, yeah, you know, he's, like he's the, the most like organized person I know with his time. Yeah. yeah. And it, but that's the way most of these elite athletes are like there. Mm -hmm. They, they have like really specific recovery schedules where masters athletes have different, we recover differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, what is it? Nine o'clock at night. I put my kids to bed and. Uh, came down here and jumped on a podcast at 8.30, right? It's like, well, we can put it in. Yeah. Um, uh, this is when masters athletes start drinking. Usually we're not worried about recovery. It's just like alcohol. Usually. Yeah yeah. 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 I mean, the, the, to, to use a Glassman quote, it, they differ in need, not kind. Right. Right. So I think the development, the hierarchical development of an athlete is, it doesn't matter if it's an individual athlete, it's a teen athlete, it's a master's athlete. It comes down to. First of all, exposure and understanding what they're capable of at that moment. But then it, they get into, if they want to compete, it gets into like skill and drill development, right? So there's like this big developmental piece in between that, right? And once they develop those baseline skills, then we start layering in the intensity of that, right? So it, it's just like the methodology, mechanics, consistency, intensity. If they are mechanically moving well, right, they don't have torn labrums and aches and pains and their feet don't hurt or whatever. And they're consistently doing that and they're learning those new skills and drills and practicing things. Then we can layer in the intensity, right? I remember when I, when I was competitive in the individual, like back in the regional days, I would always finish in the Northeast region. I would always finish like right around 60 or 70, like right outside of regionals. I was putting in three and four hours of training a day. I mean, granted, I, I own a gym and I was there all the time. So like nothing's going on. I'm like, yeah, I'll snatch, I'll back squat, I'll do whatever. Yeah, right. And now for me as an athlete, like I've acquired a lot of the skills. There's still something like they introduce double under crossovers. Like I'll work on those. Um, but like most of my focus now is on 
the intensity piece and understanding like what's going on in between my ears as I'm going through that, right? There's a big component of competing is definitely, I mean, every professional athlete ever has, has said this, what goes on between your ears, yep. right? If your body's capable and you have all those skills and drills and you can have like reasonable weights that you can lift, things like that, it comes down to what your belief structure is. What you, do you believe that you belong there, right? And I ran into that a little bit in 2017, or pardon me, 2021, when I went to the games, I qualified. And I remember I was out at Bobby's house in Indiana and we all did the workouts together. There was four of us that went there. And I found out that I qualified for the games on my drive home from Indiana back to New Jersey, like by myself in the car. And it was kind of like, man, do I belong here? Right. And I think I, I think I, in 2021, I squandered that a little bit because I remember like on that first event, it was a four and a half mile run. And I'm just like running along and I'm like, man, I'm just so happy to be here. Right. And I, I wasn't competing. Right. So, you know, as the weekend progressed, the change, but just having that, that mindset for, for all the master's athletes that I programmed for, I understand that their warmups need to be a lot longer, right? It's not like I can't be like, all right, show the bike for five minutes and then let's go hit 90% on your back squat, right? There's a, a longer trajectory that needs to be planned in there and it needs to be developed in a way that not just gets them moving in an appropriate pattern, but it also gets their, it improves their movement in some way, shape or form, right? Right. And then we go through whatever the programming for the day is, strength or skills and, you know, maybe some rowing intervals and then maybe a conditioning piece that's a little bit shorter or whatever. And then at the end, I always make sure I include some kind of like prehab rehab kind of stuff. So most of the time for master's athletes, the, the training is focused around being able to recover enough so that you can hit the other pieces with intensity. So it's funny, I've made the joke forever. As a master's athlete, if you go at 5 a.m., the first round's your warm up, or it's still yeah. part, still part of your warm up. Like you do the normal warm up, and then the first round is still part of it because you need to have the longer warm up. So I love that to hear that you're saying there's some intent behind doing that. It wasn't just me being lazy. No, um, it's definitely not you being lazy. But I, but I am curious about how much intensity you put on a master's athlete comparatively. I, I found as as I've aged, I have personally focused more on capacity over intensity. Now I'm not trying to compete, so it's a different thing than what you're describing here, but mm -hmm. I I've personally found that intensity for me, again, just for me, has never been great. You know what I mean? Like I I I don't move with as much intention as I would like to because I'm so competitive. I do a lot of dumb shit. When I, when I get really intense and I'm trying to move fast. So I focus more on like kind of capacity and moving with good movement to stay injury free. For me, it's all about, can I stay injury free and, and train six days a week as opposed to going crazy is, isn't how important is intensity to you? I mean, I think intensity is pretty important. It is one of the tenets of kind of like what we do, but I think intensity, just like movements are universally scalable. Right. And like, you might come in one day at 5 a.m. and you're like moving around through your warm up, and then you get through your first round and you're like, today ain't the day, kid. Right. So your intensity level, which normally might be pinned out at that 10, your, your, your top level for your intensity might be like a seven that day. And I think a good coach can recognize that. And a good athlete should recognize that. Does that make sense? Yeah. A co coachable athlete needs to understand when they're just not feeling it. Right. And then if I have an, like I had an athlete who was, who I programmed for, who was getting, he has something going on with his knee. Right. And so we had a lot of prehab rehab stuff in and I maneuver around the injury to make sure that, that he was able, he's a firefighter. So make sure he's still able to do his job. Right. And eventually he's, like, I just saw like his performance, just like bottom out. And I was like, I think you need a deload week, man. And I'm like, I should have recognized this sooner. It's going to keep you injury free. And as with any athlete, he's like, oh, I don't need a deload week. I'll just keep 
or whatever. But um, once I programmed in a deload week for him, he came back and he was able to kind of approach it with his same level of intensity as before. When it comes to that stuff, are, are you finding the master's athletes you're training are more or less stubborn than your younger athletes? I know it's a tough question to answer. I would say they're probably more stubborn. I, I would agree. I find that I find myself having to do a lot more explaining of methodology and what my thoughts are behind things, which is good for me because it keeps me honest, right? right. I'm not just like throwing shit on a paper and seeing what sticks. I have to actually be thoughtful about the program, right? And they go in blocks. Everything is in, for, for my competitive athletes, everything's in blocks. Now, if we're talking about like class athletes, right? Like I'll, I'll never, I'll never walk up to like Susie Q and Johnny and be like, you guys can be hitting that with some more intensity. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's instead I'm like, Hey, I'm just really glad you're here. I'm Let's glad. Let's go grandma. Here. Move it. Yeah. yeah. That's the best. Get up off that ground. Come on, Nana, uh, move it. I'm just, I'm, I'm genuinely happy that people are, are, if it's, if it's at my gym or if it's gym and I'm, right. I'm coaching at, it's like, I'm just glad you're here. I'm glad that you've made the choice to come in here and take time for yourself. Cause you don't know what people are going through, right? Like yeah. most of the members in our gym, they got other lives. It's, this isn't, this doesn't circle their, like, this isn't a peak. This isn't their, like for me, it's my entire life, right? Like I'm, I'm cross it thrown through, but for them, it's just like a piece of their day. It's, this is what I do for my movement. I got sick of running long distances and my knees hurting all the time. So I came in here and now my knees hurt all the time in here. Right. For these, these class athletes you're describing, which are, are most of us, mm -hmm. when you're thinking of the things that bring the most benefit to whether it's, uh, I'm going to break it into three areas. I'll let you prioritize them for me. Okay. Movement, nutrition, and sleep. Those are the, those are, that's the trifecta of, of good health, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. How do you prioritize that or help them or try to help them prioritize? I know you can't force them, but how do you help them prioritize that? I would actually add a fourth one to that. <laughs> Sorry. We were talking about what goes on between the ears. Yep. And once again, that's universally scalable as well, right? So some people would, would call it mental health. I call it mental resilience. It's just a little bit more of a positive spin on that. Um, I would add that into to that kind of like basket of, of right. wellness, right? And that's a really tough question. I'm asking but, for myself. That's all. Yeah. That's, I'm just trying to figure out my own life here. Is, you're like my shrink tonight. So if you know. <laughs> I think, I think. I think sleep is probably the most thing. And I'd say that I think nutrition is right behind it because if your sleep and your nutrition are out of whack on a hormonal level, like everything else is out of whack, right? So if your sleep is in a good place and your nutrition is in a good place, then we can hit those workouts with whatever the intensity is for the day, right? If your stress levels are contained, I'm not saying gone because yeah, I don't think anybody lives a stress-free life. Um, but if they're contained and you have a good, good grasp on how to quote, quote, unquote, cope with that, well, I think the movement aspect just becomes the, the fruits of that labor, right? So, and you can hear, you hear about people talk about eight hours is the best amount of sleep and yada, yada, yada. But I think it really comes down to understanding what you're going through and being clear on that with yourself and honest with yourself about that and then addressing it in the most appropriate way, right? If you're eating, if you're eating garbage and crushing margaritas five days a week, as much fun as that might be, your sleep's going to suffer. You're not going to want to move. Your mental health's going to go down a toilet. Like it's just a bad place to be. And all four of those things, everybody has control over. Right. We have control over the food we put in our body. We have control over our decision if we want to move or not. We have control over most of the time, not with two small children all the time, but when we can go to bed and when we can wake up. And then the stress reduction stuff just comes down to understanding what works best for you. Right. I think when people say that my stress reducer is the gym, I think that's a total and complete 
bullshit answer because yeah. in, in a CrossFit gym, all we're doing is exposing you to stress. Right. Yep. I agree. So, yeah. I would say sleep, nutrition, movement, mental resilience. Yeah. The sleep, order. the sleep thing's really interesting. And you said it verbatim. Most people go, all right, seven to eight hours. That's what you need. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's so much in that, that is true and not true. Yeah. Seven, eight hours is great, but you need deep sleep. You need REM mm-hmm. sleep. That's what you need. Yep. There, the time is important, but you need that. I was in bed last night for seven hours and I promise you it was not great rest because I knew I had to be up at 5 a.m. And I know you were stressing driving. out about that. Yeah, I was stressing yeah. about it and there was a thunderstorm going on. I was having these crazy dreams. It just, it wasn't restful. It wasn't good recovery. What time do you, or what temperature do you keep your house at? I keep it cold. I'll okay. do, I, I have a huge routine around sleep. I can talk okay. about this good. for hours. So I have, I have blackout curtains in my room. Yep. So it's like pitch black. I keep it 67 to 68 degrees. Like it's pretty chilly in there for the Mm -hmm. most part. Um, Real quiet. There's no noise going on in Mm -hmm. the house at all. My kids are old, so older, much older than yours. And I I take, like, I learned a couple of years ago that sleep is, once I fixed sleep, it unlocked huge doors for me as a master's athlete. It's a superpower, man. Yeah, it really is. That like... I, I tell most people the two, if you really want to unlock something as a master's athlete, there's two things you need to do that are bigger than everything else. And they start unlocking other doors. But if you can start getting good sleep and really focus on it, which means you have to get up in the morning, get morning sun because it makes you sleep better at night. Mm-hmm. You got to turn off the, like what I'm doing right now is not good. You got to get out in front of the screens and, and blue blocker glasses, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I'm looking and, at mine right now. They're right over there. Yeah, it's, it's tough. So you you got to, there's a lot of little things you have to do to make sure you're getting good sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you really want to do it, you got to cut out alcohol. You got to cut it out because man, like every drink, I, I read something, it was Huberman or somebody was talking about this. So every drink, if you, if you don't drink at all, you're going to get, we'll call it three hours of REM sleep. If you have one drink, you're going to get two hours. If you have two drinks, you're going to get one hour. It gets cut mm-hmm. dramatically. If you have three drinks, you're going to get none. Mm-hmm. And then you're done. You get no recovery at that point. You know? That's why you wake up in the morning, you feel like crap. Right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of little things that go into this that start to compound. It's, uh, it's almost like I'm a banker, so I've relayed a lot of stuff to finance, but it's like compounding interest. There's not one thing you can do to get rich. You need time. And there's a lot, about a hundred little things you have to do. And, and to get good sleep, there's, I'll call it 10 things that really make sleep happen the way you need it to happen. Yeah. Frazier was the master at this. Like notorious. I saw an interview with him the other day. This is what made me think, yep, this is why I know I'm right. His story was he was talking to his coach and he's training his ass off as only Frazier can. And. His coach is like looking around the room going, you're not training any harder than anybody else. Mm-hmm. And Frazier's like, well, how am I, how am I going to be the best? And he's like, you're going to recover better than everyone else mm-hmm. because no one else in this room is willing to go to bed at seven o'clock and to nuance their diet and all these little things you've mentioned. Mm-hmm. And that's what made him the five-time champ was that he was not, like, there's so many stories about him that have come out to where. He was just crazy about his sleep and his rest, almost to the point where it's, you think about it, like how it impacts your family. And Tim's this way. I've, I've literally tried to get Tim on the podcast a dozen times. And he's been on several times and he's great every time. But he's like, bro, we got to do it at 6 p.m. because I'm going to bed <laughs> at 7. I'm like, are you kidding me? He's like, no, I'm not kidding. I'm going to bed at 7 o'clock. I'm like, all there's, right. There's you know? times that I'll send him a message at 8 p.m. Like, because I like something comes up. I'm thinking of something for the gym and uh, I won't get a message until five o'clock the next morning. And I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. He's asleep. I, yeah. I believe that completely. That's, uh, I'm actually kind of excited those, that it, that he's uh, retiring. Cause I might actually get him on the show at some point past 7 PM. We'll right. see about that. Yeah. Maybe we'll see. We'll see about that. What's the, when you, when you think of getting rid of the stress, like the between the ears piece you mentioned, mm. what are, mm. what are your kind of one or two big tips for that. And I think, I think most people don't understand where their stress comes from. Right. 
I'm going to pitch a, an organization, if that's okay. Yeah. Throw it so out. There, there's a, an organization called Between the Ears. They work with street parking. They work with a number of, of organizations. They were out at the ranch a, a little while ago, and it's Bill and Karyan Anthes. Karyan was a level four flow master. Bill was on staff. They owned CrossFit Morristown for a while. Bill's now a clinical therapist. He's actually my clinical therapist. And former SF, Army SF guy, like just the, him and his wife are just fantastic people. And they run a seminar called Between the Ears. And not saying that this is the route that everybody takes, but one of the things they do is like everything that we do within CrossFit is with intention, right? So before a workout, you kind of have to write that intention out. What are you expecting to do here? So all that to say, I think things like journaling are fantastic. With my wellness clients, one of the things I have them do if they're like having a hard time with something is right before bed, I call it the offload. They're basically going to take whatever's milling through their head and just write it down, right? Because that will take it from your brain, put it on a piece of paper, and it's, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I can wake up tomorrow morning and look at this piece of paper and be like, okay, this is what I need to do to attack these things, right? I think diaphragmatic breathing does a really great job of doubt regulating and understanding how to do that. There's, I mean, there's a billion, maybe not a billion, but there's a lot of YouTube videos on yep. diaphragmatic breathing. stress reduction, not eating like shit. Uh, <laughs> as fun as it may be. As fun, you know what? I'm, I'm a, I'm a 80, 20 kind of guy where I'm not like, I'm not captain. No fun. I competed at the Asbury park summer games over, over the weekend, last weekend. Yep. And I was back in New Jersey. So I was hanging out with some friends and I had a couple of drinks and I woke up on Monday and I was like, I feel like dog shit. Yeah. My ankles feel like hell. Yes. Yeah. I, remember, I know that feeling. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not captain no fun, but like when you know you have something coming up or you, you need to focus on it, like journaling is a great method. Breathing is, is the way to kind of like center everything, right. And bring everything back to, back to your chi or whatever. And then controlling what you can control. Right. So as a dad of two young kids, I don't always have control over my schedule. So giving myself some grace, if I need to get a workout in being able to like, Hey, I'm supposed to have this 60 minutes of training, but I've got 30. Okay. Well, what are the most important pieces here and not stress about it, right? It's, it's just life. You're not going to get less fit because you did 30 less minutes of workout. Right. Right. I think, I think. Specifically, Americans are really hard on themselves as to what, what the expectation of everybody else is of them versus what their own expectations are of them. Right. So, well, we have this corporate 40 hour work week that the rest of the <laughs> world doesn't recognize and it almost makes you want to leave the U S makes you want I, to move to Europe. I think the power of journaling for me is. It's no different than if you think about if you're using like MyFitnessPal or some mm -hmm. macro tracker, right? Mm -hmm. And you start tracking your food and you're looking at calories and macros. And over time, if you do it long enough, you really start to see the trends in your body, right? And particularly if you're weighing yourself every day. And you, if, you're, if you really look at it, and it, maybe I'm wired differently. Like I'm just really anal about numbers and I look for trends. And you can start to notice, wow, I ate that. And the water weight changed my body this day. And so, mm -hmm. and you start to figure that out and you, you start to see like how it shifts during the week. And the power that comes from that is understanding what food's doing to your body where generally it's no different. If you're tracking or writing down how stressed you were in traffic or what your day at work was like, or your kids are yelling at you or whatever is going on in your life, you do that long enough. You start to connect those things. You're like, that's the trigger. Mm -hmm. whatever that may be. And it could be anything like today I was on the turnpike for three hours 
And that's a pretty easy trigger to figure out because the turnpike sucks, like when you're mm-hmm. driving. But not everybody recognizes that. And so the power of journaling is really, really unreal to understand what it does for you. And I think often, particularly you mentioned Americans, so those of us as Americans, we don't think about the, com- the compounding pressure that the stress is putting on your body and what it does to the rest of you mm-hmm. over time. And, and stress is a killer. It, it's, it makes your workouts worse. It, uh, it's know. a literal killer. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you heart yeah, attacks. Like, yeah. It'll give you a heart attack. Right. I like to f- focus a lot of my attention on things that I can control, which are my words, my actions, my feelings towards things and creating a little bit of understanding, but that's not like something you can't just tell somebody that, right? That's a, right. that's a practice. Um, being aware of, of what you're doing and saying to others is also another way to reduce your strength. Yep. So do you, do you think masters athletes should be taking on the same load as younger athletes? Meaning I think most younger athletes are five days a week. Mm -hmm. The the prescribed CrossFit method is three days on, one day off, two days, that sort of Mm -hmm. thing. You get a couple of days of rest. Do you Mm -hmm. think masters athletes can, can stay at that same kind of tempo as younger athletes, or is it just measured by the individual? I think it's measured by the individual. I think it depends, right? Because if you have somebody mastered or not, somebody that's just starting out at the gym, my usual recommendation is, is how about we try three days a week? Let's, let's be consistent at three days a week and let's see how you feel, right? I think it's like, it's like following the recommendations of your woo, right? Or some kind of data tracker that you have, right? It's, oh, I'm in the red today. I probably, I probably am a, I'm going to be a shithead in my workout or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, it's, right. no, I mean, once again, that's another indicator of what level of intensity you should approach it with. I think everybody <clears throat> eventually needs to get to a point where they're moving their body intentionally right? Not just walking from the car into the building, right? But moving their body with intention would be with a mindset of intention for 30 minutes a day at minimum, right? Everybody, 99% of the population is capable of doing that, right? But once again, it's universally scalable, right? I do think there is a point that, that masters athletes tend to overdo it more so than people, they underdo it, right? Where they're like, all of a sudden they're in the gym for four hours a day and you know, their work life is going to shit and their relationships are going to shit. Everything else around them is going to shit, but they're getting real fit, man. And then they get injured and then they're like, oh shit, what do I do here? Yeah. That's the problem with master. We tend to overdo everything. And I think you said it at kind of the top of that is like the, the, it's the consistency. Let's get three days consistent. For me, it's always been, can I stay uninjured and be as consistent as possible? You'll always beat that person that's going hard for five days a week, but they get injured every mm-hmm. 20 days. If you can, if you can train for a year uninjured, you will absolutely beat that guy that's injured two or three times a year. Cause they got to take weeks off at a time and, yep. and they're in recovery during those other weeks. Yep. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's, an, that's one of the more negative aspects of the class model, right? Is like. People go into a class model and everybody has that one athlete that they're like me and you, right? Right. Um, I think I'm with, I'm a training think tank athlete. I've been working with those guys for four years now. And I think they approach it really intelligently. And then it's like, you don't have control over the workouts. You don't have control over somebody else's, you know, how they are going to perform any of that stuff. You have control over your effort and that is it in a workout your willingness to want to do whatever the thing is, right? I could, I could want to outlift Tim. I still have him in one lift. I'm only allowed to have one lift on him and I still have it. But I, I may want to outlift Tim, but I physically just can't, right? So it's like my effort is whatever my best opportunity is at that given time, right? 
What what's the lift? I'm dying to know what the lift is now. I can now back squat them. Can you? Oh yeah, wow. Yeah, that's sure. a, that's impressive. I'm a Which I'm a five five hundred pound back squatter. Damn, son. It's been that's, a while, but that's real weight. That is real weight. Well, I, I man, come on, Tim, step it up, bro. Yeah, I'm, you know what? He's retiring, man. How much can his dad do though? Can you out back sweat his dad? Probably not. <laughs> got, I got dad strength. He's got grandpa strength. Bro. He has got some serious grandpa yeah. strength. I was hoping earlier you were talking about some master that these you're like, we're not going to name him. I'm, I was hoping you were going, we're not going to name him, but we're going to call him Tim's dad. <laughs> we're going to call him Jerry. Yeah, we're just going. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, dude, this has been fun. This is you're great to get your insight around yep. what's going on with master's athletes. I think this is a, all, all of us are kind of searching for whatever that special formula is. And I think what you've described tonight, there's actually no special formula. It's different than what the Matt Frazier's and the Justin Medeiros of the world are doing. It's just to your point, scale to kind, like you got to make it adapted to what you're capable of at this far advanced age. Those mm-hmm. of us are doing so. What's next for you? What do you have coming up? I was invited to Crash Crucible in October, I think. Um, they're they're doing the first year of Masters Athletes at Crash. Okay. And they invited a bunch of 35 to 39 semifinal athletes and me. Nice. So I am, I think I'm the only 40 to 40, 40, 40, 40 year old athlete. And what are the dates for the, Ma- the Masters Fitness Collective this year? It is September 29th, 30th, and October 1st. You guys have a qualifier starting soon, or have they already started? Already done. Already we already done? have all, all of our numbers. Yep. Everybody's already signed up. I was talking but, to Jason. Jason Grubb's coming. He, he yep. sent me a DM, told me he's going to be there. He's trying to talk me into showing up. And I want to come, but here's my problem if I come. In Fort Wayne, Indiana is the greatest guitar store that has ever existed. And as you can see, like you can't really see yeah, behind I, me. But I can see it. Dude, I got 13 guitars in this room and I'm not sure I can afford to drive there and leave without another guitar. So like, I'm, str- is, I'm, I'm struggling. What, what is the greatest guitar store? Sweetwater. Is what it's called. Oh yeah. Yeah. That guy, he owns so much of that town, man. Oh, I'm sure. Well, he, first of all, he's one of the biggest music stores on the planet. Yeah. And this is nothing to do with CrossFit. So people are like logging off right now, but. Yeah. Yeah. Here's their business model. So you log into their website and you start buying stuff and they assign you a salesperson. My salesperson's name is Luke. And anytime I buy something, that dude calls me. Here's how good they are, dude. Do you want to talk about great customer service? You could apply this to a CrossFit gym, I guess. I'll order something. Luke will call me and say, hey, I got your order. It's going out today. You'll have it in a few days. And then I swear to God, it'll show up the next day. Yep. They always... Under promise. Yeah. Over deliver every time. And because their name is Sweetwater, they put a little pack of candy in the box. (laughs) So you get like this little pack. It's got like little red hots and a bit of honey and a couple other things. And it's great, dude. I've, I've spent tens of, I've spent thousands of dollars with those guys. I think Bob, Bobby, he owns car dealerships too. And I'm not surprised. I think Bobby's bought, he bought his Corvette from him. He's got like a 2022 red Corvette. Yeah. They're like, they're, they're legends in the guitar community for what they do. And, and like their quality control is great. Yeah. You know, they're a real testament to if you want to run a business the right way, here's how you do it. And, and not that, not that different than the way, the way you're describing your gym. You, know, you start something you're like, Hey, this is a real business. I got to do it the right way. And you do it the right way. And listen, like it, it all comes down to care. Yeah. Right. And you'll hear some affiliate owners be like, you can't care if you run a business. And I think that's horseshit. I think you need to care about the people that are coming in your door. If you don't care about them, they're not going to keep coming back. If they're not coming back, guess what? You don't have a business. Well, that's one thing I've always been impressed with Tim. He's always said, I'm an affiliate owner first, the game's athlete second. Mm-hmm. And, and that's when you know somebody cares. Scott Panchek's the same way. I've met so many people like that. And, and that's why you guys have been successful. So congratulations on your, you said 12 years. So that's. Yep. Amazing coming stuff. Up on, coming up on 11 years. 11 years will be October will be 11 years. Yep. All right. Well, I hope I run into you at the event. I can't promise because I don't want to spend that money, but I told Jason I would be there. So I'm 
probably going to hop in the car and drive over at least for a day. So, All right. That'd be great. All right. Well, thanks for joining. For everyone listening, I hope you guys enjoyed Master's Moment. We'll be back next week. Take care. Thanks, Sean.